Uh, so, uh, Mario, I want to talk a little bit about um, your workflow and your process. Um, let's start in the box with the plugins. Now, do you you come from an analog background and working in studios? Do you treat plugins the same way? Like you have certain plugins that you like to go to for certain instruments, or how do you approach that? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I kind of do. I mean, there. I mean, we've been talking for talking before about. A, a common plugin I'll use for drums, for example, is I'll go to um, E Channel, mm -hmm. uh, SSL E Channel. Um, I, those EQs I really like. They're very kind of pointy, uh, or they can get pointy if you need them to be for uh, uh, attack on drums and that sort of stuff. So, so I, I really like that kind of sound. It doesn't mean it applies to every song or every production, but um, or every mix, but um. So that's kind of a go-to mm -hmm. thing that 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 I'll that I'll do, and I really love um, filter bank Mic DSP EQs, uh, especially there's certain things in the top end that are very musical for me. So I'll use those almost on anything. I mean, I'm a big fan of of the filter bank EQs. I just can't get enough of them. Um, and there's it's it's funny how how some things you interpret as kind of being more musical than others but mm -hmm. um but i even even with that being said and there are some things that that i might consider go to for certain things it it's really doesn't matter i mean that could change in an instant if there's a, a direction for the song that that i've been told uh, needs to be needs to sound a certain way sonically and and i might change that completely um I mean, ultimately, I'm I'm concerned with end result. So, um, if that get if whatever plugin gets me there, that's then then that's okay. I'm not going to have a big problem with changing. You know what I mean? But yeah, there are things that I'll start with and workflow. Like certain instruments, um, will sound well. For example, like I'd said, the the filter bank is kind of it's very musical. It sounds good on everything. Um, but 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 the e channels in general across the board, um, no matter what emulation you're using, I really like the way SSLs sound if you need punchy drums. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course there are times when you want something to have a different tone, maybe for guitars or bass, and you want to use some kind of a Neve-ish emulation or something. Um, it, I know I, I I actually end up using the Ultimate Compressor a lot. Um, Let's see, the Shep 73, I think, is a nice Neve-ish, uh, well, I guess best right on, I think it's modeled after his Neve console. Uh, but, I mean, it's so endless with all these options. I mean, there are certain things that I'll tweak fast and I'll use quickly, like Eventide's H3000. Mm -hmm. I use it all the time, and I'm, you know, and you can tweak the... Um, uh, the feedback and the delay on each side, depending on how stereo you want it and how much, and how much depth... Um, I love it. And, it, and and I, there's some kind of comfort too in seeing the H3000 interface and it comes up in the plugin form and I just think, oh, okay, this is great. And, yeah. and you tweak it kind of like you would tweak a real H3000. I love that. Um, yeah, the, I, there's ton, tons of, tons of things like that. Um, but yeah. still, it's, it's still dependent on end result ultimately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you think, uh, rely a lot on familiarity when you use those in the analog realm or say like mixing on a, an SSL console or uh, having an actual H3000, um, having that connection to the analog piece, do you think that that, you know, speeds up your workflow when you're using the plug-in version or are they different animals? Well, they're different animals, but, but it does speed it up. I think so. I mean, I, I really like SSL consoles. Um, I mean, I, I, I like Neve's vintage news in particular as well but mixing on an SSL console is really fantastic um, it's 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 laid out um, in a very ergonomic way I, uh, I like the way uh, I like where things are kind of placed on it I mm -hmm. think that things are easy to find they're easy to see mm -hmm. and and ultimately the sound I like too but um, all of that stuff translates to this and and, and some plugins are better than others at it, um, but I think it still it helps. Mm -hmm. um, SSL, you know, even as you're seeing, like if you're using an SSL bus compressor, um, no matter which emulation you're using, 
um, a lot of that kind of metering and a lot of the the knobs that even try to make it look pretty close to it, um, all that becomes very familiar, you know, mm-hmm. especially if you've used an SSL bus compressor. compressor. Um, actually, SSL uh, makes their own plug-in version of that too, which I have, and it's, it's outstanding. It's really good. Um, and it looks just like, you know, um, uh, yeah. it looks like, like a picture of an SSL. Right. Um, but I think it totally speeds up workflow. I mean, it does for me. And, and, but look, that might not always be the answer. I mean, sometimes you come up, come across a new plugin and it's got a totally different interface and you might go, okay, uh, I, I got to dive into this. I know what, like, you know, Isotope has some plugins where the, I, I opened them up and I eventually really love using them. But then I think, whoa, okay, there's a lot going on here. Let's start with this and let's see what this does. Mm-hmm. Um, or I, like, I remember like Futzbox came out and I thought, whoa, okay, there's a bunch of things down here. What's going on? And then then quickly you just get to hang it. And now I use it all the time. And um, what's another one? I was just thinking of one. But um, but there's there's tons of examples of of like, oh, I know like Subboom Bass is a, is a sub uh, software synth that I use a lot for, for 808 sub bass and type, that kind of stuff. And um, there's a ton of stuff going on there. I just think, oh, okay, but that's okay. Yeah. yeah that's what it is. And how do you balance um, sort of staying on top of with all the new technology and new plugins coming out? Um, how do you balance that with, you know, sticking to things that you know really well that keep your workflow moving? Um, because you're you're working with a lot of clients, you're working on uh, deadlines. You know, how much time do you have to experiment? And it, it it varies. I mean, it just depends. I mean, I think the thing is, is if you are under those types of uh, demanding schedules, which oftentimes we are, it, um, you need to just trust your ears and, and know that you go with something that works. Um, and you don't necessarily need to say, ah, oh, but I didn't get the new EQ on that channel. I don't care about that at all. I mean, I love hearing new things and, and if it works, great. But if you've got something to mix and you've got some kind of a deadline, mm-hmm. make it sound great. I, I'm not gonna be worried about not trying something. Um, I mean, when I have the luxury of time, I will do that, but um, it isn't always the case. So so those plugins that you know really well become even more useful because you know you know what they're gonna what they're gonna do, right? Um, so, yeah, yeah. I know. I know with myself. Sometimes I suffer from uh, recency bias, and, and the way <laughs> I know that is, I'll look at you know, open a session that's a, a couple years old, mm-hmm. and I can look at the session and be like, oh yeah, that's when I was like really obsessed with because I had just gotten this new <laughs> thing and it's on like everything, you right. know. Um, so that I yeah, I, but then as you said, you kind of you want to lean on the things that you know. Yeah, and, well, you you do. I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of plugins like that for me where, you know, like when Decapitator came out, right? Everything, oh my <laughs> everything gosh. gets Decapitator. It's, I mean, yeah, and it's so good. It I is. Mean, it's such a great, amazing tool, and it does get used a lot. That's just what it comes down to, and it's okay. It, 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 I mean, you get to balance how much you're hearing that, but but. Some of the best plugins aren't doing that much. They, right. they might be doing a very little bit, but it's enough character to give it something. I mean, one of the early examples of that is funny. I was talking to somebody about this the other day. I can't remember who, but Lo-Fi, the, one of the early Pro Tools plugins that, that digit, did when, when it was DigiDesign, and I don't know if you know this plugin, Lo-Fi, um, mm-hmm. it, 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 it kind of, to me, that... I went through a whole phase where it was like, oh, everything's got to be low. You know, put that on and, and saturation, distortion, and all this. Yeah. Um, and it's great, but it, 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 even using that in such a subtle way, I mean, I've used it where it's just point one on one little setting, and that's all it's doing. And mm-hmm. it, just that alone makes a big difference in the tone of of the instrument. Right. You know, whether it's a vocal or a drum or whatever. Um, so you you... With with those kinds of things, you you learn them as much as possible, and you know how effective how effective they can be, um, and and yeah, you may have a phase of, of like decapitator or lo-fi you're using right. nonstop or Futzbox was one, um, Echo Boy, but that's kind of different because you need delays. But Echo Boy is a great yeah. tool. I mean, it's very very fast. Um, 
a one that I, I mean, I'm black hole that reverb. Mm-hmm. I love it. I use it so much, and it's almost like you use it as oh well, how can I fit more of this into the, right. <laughs> into the song? Um, but there's a lot. There's a lot of them like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then so, um, if I'm understanding, then with your hybrid setup. You yeah. have 16 channels of output, so typically eight stereo pairs. Yeah, and, and to be more specific, it's actually, technically, I only use 14 of the outputs. The reason is, is because on the HDIO, um, those last two outputs, 15 and 16, I'm actually utilizing those for mix return. Okay. So um, because my I use a dangerous monitor ST, uh, I need to use an analog input to hear the return of my mix. Because of that, I'm using 15 and 16. Got it. Um, otherwise, if the Dangerous Monitor ST had an AES input, for example, mm-hmm. I would then put 15 and 16 on the two bus. That isn't the case, so I'm actually using one through 14. Okay. Um, if that yeah, if that makes sense. So so um, now the gr- you have some really great pieces of outboard. Are they? sort of have fixed roles or does it change on depending on the mix how do you how do you incorporate um, the outboard the, the, for for um for for example for mix bus over here on the right side um coming off of the two bus i have the dangerous back stereo eq which is a mastering grade eq with with uh, uh, uh stepped attenuators mm-hmm. it's t- attenuation now i really like that because it's very easy for, for recall. Um, and in this scenario, you know, the, the speed of projects these days, it, that's really important. I really don't want to mess around with, you know, voltaging every, every little um, recall to get it exact. It's, it's, it's slow and it's not uh, very accurate all the time. Mm-hmm. So in this case, the, that those stepped pots are really important. Um, but also with the back CQ, it's a stereo EQ with really proper uh, high pass and low pass filters. That's one of the main reasons I I ended up getting that that EQ actually. But um, so so the uh, the two bus feeds the back uh, back CQ in this in this setup, and then that feeds um, the Pendulum ES8 um, limiter. Uh, but that is fixed, and that's always a fixed uh, setting. So I never change that. Um, and it's set up into split dual mono, um, okay. so I don't want it. I don't want the um, uh, transients hitting the compressor on one side. Um, uh, you know, for example, something happening on the left, and I don't want the right picking it up. So they're they're uh, operating independently. But um, basically, it, it, that's a fixed setting. Um, and so, so I that's will, where your gain staging in the box becomes important because you're setting your levels to hit the compressor at. You're not a, a adjusting the input of the no. or the threshold of the compressor. No, that set, you're you're affecting how it's hitting. It. That's correct. Yeah, okay. I mean, there the, with one ad, very important addition to that, and that is that uh, on the dangerous two bus, and this is the original one that I have, um, and you can see it right here. Not only do you have your 60B and mono uh, switches, but you have a stepped output gain. Okay, that's extremely important because that's really what feeds the pendulum. So yes, of course, your outputs of Pro Tools are feeding a two bus, and that's important with your gain structure, absolutely. Um, but that dangerous is pretty clean, and as long as you're actually in healthy output levels on your I.O., on your interface, um, you're going to be in, in pretty good shape. So then it depends on what's the level like going to your pendulum, and that's where you might adjust the okay. output of the two bus. So, so it's almost so. like a pre-master fader if you're hitting the compressor too hard, you can it, pull it, back it, on the it's two. It's very bus. much like that. Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, it's kind of uh, it's it's acting like a master fader uh, mm-hmm. pre compressor, exactly, and and pre EQ too. But yeah, okay. because it goes um, two bus back EQ pendulum, and then that goes uh, feeds back into Pro Tools. So okay. that'll be the print. And then, do you have a, a digital mix bus chain as well once it comes the, on the two track or uh, almost always? I will. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean that and that changes depending on the song. I mean, that that could be a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. Um, almost for sure, right, you have uh, an EQ or two or a, a compressor or two or, or sometimes a limiter, um, and that is very style dependent. I mean, they're, they're 
some styles of music that you don't even want to go near a limiter. It's, it's like a bad word. <laughs> right. um, and then there's some where you need two limiters. You know what I mean? It's, so it's just very style dependent. So on one hand, yeah, this side of the analog chain is fixed in a sense. I mean, the backs is obviously, you tweak that EQ, but um, the pendulum's fixed. But when you get to the, to the, uh, uh, in the, in the box stereo bus, yeah, that changes a lot. Um, one thing I've been messing around with is um, I've been doing this for a while, but I've been doing it more with the slate. Once I got the slate, everything bundle is I've been using a little bit of the um, E channel um, console emulator, and that seems to give it a nice tone. Um, sometimes I use the Neve in there, mm -hmm. um, but I'll put that on the stereo bus too. You know, inside the box, and um, anything that helps that tone, you know, I'm 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 down for. So. Yeah. And how early in the mix are you engaging your mix bus processing? Pretty early on, but but um, so I do something where I will, and this is kind of because I'm just used to setting the gain structure. Um, I'll set uh, uh, like a compressor, for example, with a certain output gain. Uh, usually something like I'll, I'll, I'll give myself an additional 3 dB of gain. Um, and in a way, I think about it kind of like a safety feature mm -hmm. where it's almost like 3 dB of dummy gain. So I'm outputting 3 dB from whatever compressor, it could be SSL or ultimate compressor, or whatever. Um, and so... I'm, I'm building my gain structure. I'm putting drums up and bass and all that. Um, but I'm getting 3 dB extra of where I would normally be if I had, let's say the compressor was in bypass. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be 3 dB down. But even if I, ha I have it in the chain, and it might not even be compressing at all, but I'm still getting that 3 dB output. It's kind of like a safety feature for me. Okay. And so, uh, and oftentimes I'll be in the, in, in the mix and... I might be feeling like I'm getting a little hot and I think, all right, I'm just going to bring my dummy gain back down a dB or two or three. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just kind of something that I got used to doing. It's not, there's no real right or wrong to it. Um, mm -hmm. But, but so, so yes, I'll have those compressors and stuff in, but I'm not really doing that much to them until I really get a balance with every single instrument in the song unmuted. Um, I don't really want to be pumping a compressor with just drums, bass, and vocal. If anything, you, you might not even be hitting it at all at that point. Um, I want to get a, a representation of what's going on with all the tracks in before I'm worrying about how, how the compressor is really pumping. Um, and, you know, not all songs need to be pumping, but you know what I mean, how it's, how it's hitting mm -hmm. it. Um, and sometimes I might have two compressors. I mean, no matter what, in this chain that we're talking about here, this pendulum, which is doing very little almost all the time, it's not doing much, um, but it technically is doing some compression. So you already have one layer of that happening before it gets back to Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. And then once you're back into Pro Tools, then, then you can just you know take it as many steps further as you want. Um, right. But at that point, it's already getting a little bit of that kind of creamy tone of the pendulum. So So it's there is a layer of compression already there. But um, I do my best to build up the track so that it's got a really good representation with everything in and EQ'd and compressed and unmuted before I'm you know, doing any kind of like serious limiting or slamming, you know what I mean? Because I'll start building a mix and I'll see, you might, and it depends on the instrumentation, of course, you might push up a kick drum for a move or you might, do things in a song where you see, oh, it really affects that compressor differently because of the way the drum is hit, or for example, um, you may have to change the attack settings. You know, maybe the attack is really light. You know what I mean? And you and you're not getting much out of that compressor. So that's that's something that I'll change a lot as the track is building up. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And do you put an extra limiter on? Um to deliver your mixes to your clients? Like, what's your philosophy on the level that you deliver? That's a good question. Again, client dependent. Okay. Uh, there, are, I know, for example, I mi mixed a record this year by uh, Demir Demir Khan, who's a, uh, uh, 
excellent Turkish uh, rock star. Actually, he's great. Um, he's not um, super well known in the States, but um, I, I mixed a record he produced last year, and then um, this year he was doing his solo record. And so I ended up mixing it for him. And um, this was a very old school kind of thinking. Um, having a limiter on it was, he was like, no way. I mean, even in the beginning when we were mixing the first song, he was kind of like less and less and less uh, uh, compression, uh, let alone limiting. He was even worried about some of the compression. So we were really mixing in a very old school sort of mindset mm -hmm. where, where for, for, for this particular record, it was like, even if I put a little compression on certain things, he'd, he'd hear it. And he'd say, ah, that sounds a little compressed. And it sometimes it would surprise me, and I'd say, wow, okay, you got ears. You can hear that on the bass or whatever. Mm -hmm. But that was, again, it's client dependent. He was really looking for a particular sound, and he wanted it to be punchy, but really like tape punchy, analog style. So, we're, and since I'm doing it hybrid, you know, I was using a lot of plugins to achieve that, but I don't want to be using SSL compressors, and it's, it's not that kind of sound. Mm -hmm. The flip side to that is a lot of um, artists now want things to sound as finished as possible, limiting included, even on a rough mix, or, or even if, you, if you're doing an official mix, they might say um, they want a limiter on the mix because they just like the way it sounds. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that there are enough artists and, and, and producers too now, of course, that are savvy enough to know we like the mix with the limiter, you're going to send that mix with your limiting to the mastering engineer. So it's almost pre-mastered, mm -hmm. really. I mean, that, that is a thing, too. So it's just client-dependent. If somebody, if I have a client that's saying, take all the limiting off for the mastering, but it's okay for you to send me that as a reference, then, that, then I'll do that. It's, it's, it's no problem. Yeah. yeah. And now that the streaming services... Um, we seem to be getting very close to having a standard in terms of um, the loudness targets. It seems like for us on the mixing side, the advantage is now we have more headroom to play with, yeah. right? more dynamic range. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Um, have you, well, I, I may have just answered the question, but how has that changed the way you mix um, now that, you know, we, we sort of have, we know what happened, say, 10 years ago, 15 yeah. years ago, yeah. the loudness wars yeah. and shrinking dynamic range. And now that it's starting to open up a little bit more, how, how are you? I think it's a really good thing okay. for music, personally. I never liked anything about any of the loudness wars. It only got worse <laughs> for me. Um, I mean, it's. I think it's okay musically and creatively to make things loud. I'm, that's a different story. Right. Um, but the loudness wars, that whole discussion and having, you know, oh, that track needs to sound louder on the iPod shuffle or whatever, that, that is, I mean, it, it, it became a problem. I mean, making records and worrying about that is not what you want to worry about when you're making a record. But with that said, and now with the, what you're saying about Spotify, it is really cool, in my opinion, that you have to worry about that less and less. And mm -hmm. the competitive nature of... You know, how loud can I get, you know, two L2s and an L3 to sound? And how, how, how loud can this be? It's, it's a kind of now almost, we're not there yet, but it's becoming more and more irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And even I, I, I played a song just a day or two ago, and it was the same song that I had mixed and now I'm trying to remember what song it was, but I played my version, the mastered version from iTunes and I played the mastered version from Spotify. And um, Spotify is leveling everything down. Right. So yeah, I think, I personally think it's good. I mean, it, I don't really think it should be something that you're obsessed with and just how to make things loud. It's not, Yeah. It, 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 to me it has nothing to do with the creative component or musical component of a song. It's just loudness, that's all it is. Um, so I think it's a good thing, and it's, if anything, it hasn't completely changed workflow in that regard, but at least it's opened the discussion so that artists that may not be hip to that, they know now, or I can tell them, like, hey, by the way, the loudness wars are not really a thing anymore. Mm -hmm. you, know, 
you know, and this is already pretty loud, you know. Um, so if you want it loud, cool, but no, look, let's talk about it. And, and why do you want it loud? Because they might not really know that it's not really a thing anymore. Mm-hmm. And, and, and every service is leveling them off a little differently. Right. So Spotify, for, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but Spotify drops it by a certain DB, Apple, Apple Music does their Pandora mm-hmm. and Tidal, and they all have their own uh, algorithms for how they, how they lower the tracks. Um, I think it's a good thing. And hopefully, if, if the uh, secret council of streaming services is watching this, uh, maybe sometime in the future we can get a standard because, yeah, it's, you know, one is minus 14 and one is minus 13 and where the peaks can be. It, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> we're really happy. It's getting better. Let's maybe try to get to one yeah, standard. one standard would be good. Would be, I mean, uh, that, 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 you know, know I'll, I'll cross my fingers yeah, for that, but, but um, you know. So uh, I want to switch gears a little bit, and, and mm. you know we're talking about delivering to clients, and yeah, the theme of this 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 is client oriented. Mm-hmm. Um, you've had the experience uh, in the last couple years, and I think we can announce uh, now uh, with the the new Harry Nielsen um, posthumous record coming out, mm-hmm. and, and the David Bowie um, that you were part of. Um, working with artists that unfortunately are no longer with us. Yeah, yeah. Without getting into too, you know, um, specific details, but what is the challenges um, besides maybe the obvious ones of of working in a situation like that where, you know, the artist isn't there and, and, Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, they're, 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 Similar but different in in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, I feel very lucky to be involved with them. Um, the the main differences between those two. I mean, for one, uh, Bowie uh, in this example was somebody that I actually knew, mm-hmm. and so and I had started working for him in two thousand and two. So I I have a long history of working with David, I, and it's been like beyond a. A, a lucky blessing in my life. I mean, it's incredible still, and sometimes it's still hard to to believe it. Um, but my point is, is I knew him and worked with him on and off. Whereas with Harry Nielsen, um, I I never never knew Harry Nielsen. I mean, of course, I knew his uh, records, mm-hmm. but um, I never knew him. Now, the producer of the Harry Nielsen record, Mark Hudson, knew him extremely well and knew him for many decades um so that's the main two things because and and one other difference is that with the bowie record so the bowie record we're talking about is uh it's called never let me down 2018 and um that came out last year uh and it was part of the loving the alien box set um and hopefully it will be released on its own uh in maybe before too long i don't know but um so that's a, a record that i actually produced um, and it was a little bit of a different beast. I, ha- I had a lot more uh, input on mm-hmm. it, um, and I had a lot of new recordings that I ha- that I that I had to do, and then which uh, ultimately I ended up mixing here at Incognito. But um, the Harry Nielsen thing, which I also mixed here, um, Mark Hudson had produced that the original part of it, which I think, and I could be a little wrong about this, but had started around ninety one, ninety two. And I think went into '93 before Harry had passed, mm-hmm. uh, passed away. Um, he started that record then, and so he had been waiting, you know, over 25 years to get his hands on this and get approval from Harry's estate and 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 um, and, and finish the record the the way that he wanted to finish it, and of course that Harry would have wanted it to be finished. So. I don't know which one to talk about first, but the, yeah. but the the Harry thing was was distinctive in the sense that it was actually almost part restoration, and Mark had been working with Harry on songs in in various cities and various um, times over that two or three year period, um, and sometimes they'd be in Chicago, for example, and they they they'd run into a rehearsal studio and put something down and they came up, came back with a cassette tape and that's what he had. Mm. So he, for example, or for, 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 for a song, for example, 
I won't spill any beans about song too much song stuff, but for example, one song could have been a cassette tape where the vocal was extracted via audionamic software and you're trying to finish the song based around that. Mm-hmm. So that is it's very challenging. I mean that that's it's not just producing a record and mixing a record, you're restoring a vocal as well. Mm-hmm. And so every song had a ver- uh uh, a varying degree of how complete it was. Um, but all of them, of course, the essence of it was that you had Harry's vocal on mm-hmm. every song. Um, so it, it ended up being a really special project, and I know it was very special for Mark because he was close to Harry and and um, wanted this to, uh, to as, as anybody would think, wanted it to be great. Um, it, it, with the Bowie project... Um, Never let me down. The, the 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 quick kind of gist of that project is that David had an album that he released in 1987, the original mm-hmm. Never Let Me Down, and that we could talk about for hours too. But I'll try and sum it up. Basically, he wasn't happy with it, and and was very public about it and made it well known pretty quickly after the album was released. It was maybe even the next day. Uh, after the album was released. Um, and he had basically been saying for years, I, I, I want a, another shot at that album. I want to redo it. I want to do... And it, it, that wasn't a common thing or... I mean, n- nobody really did that yeah, kind of thing. a few and examples of that. It, well, in music. I, we couldn't think of any yeah. I, in, in this specific way. I couldn't think of any examples. And, and Reeves Gabrels, who was... Um, playing guitar on um, the bulk of the new material, new material. He was kind of the main guitar player. He basically, we were at dinner one night, and uh, his wife was Susan was with us, and we were just think, put, trying to put our heads together, thinking there are other kind of projects where they've redone stuff, but this, not like this, where they're taking an actual album and keeping. It's the same songs. Mm-hmm. It's the same vocal, even, but everything else is now new. Mm-hmm. Um, so and so because of that, it, David really liked the songs, and he made that really well known. He, he he basically said, "I love these songs. I didn't do justice to this songs with this production." Mm-hmm. So in two thousand and eight, he actually called me uh, and said, "I got this idea." So I went over to his place, and he said, "This is what we're gonna do." And I'm going to take the tr- the first song was Time Will Crawl, and which was actually at that point was probably my favorite of the songs on the original album. And he said we're going to we're going to redo this, but you're going to keep my vocal, and we're going to put drums. And he basically reproduced the song, um, and new new drum acoustic drums, uh, no, acu- acoustic strings. We're going to move some things around, and and of course as we got into it, he had more ideas as we went along. But that became a blueprint. For, in my mind, um, in, in, for what the new uh, Never Let Me Down 2018 became. So um, he was very happy with that and had kind of said, one day I want to do this to the whole album. And so I didn't really know that that was ever going to happen. Um, and then I uh, found out via the estate that, okay, the, we're going to try and fulfill these wishes, so now, now's the time to do it. So, um, yeah, so th- those are kind of the big differences. At the Bowie thing, I was kind of there in that regard, whereas with Harry and Mark, I was doing my best to um, make Mark happy, and, and also Mark was trying to make Harry happy. You know, it's kind of like Mark's trying to make Harry happy beyond the grave, and I'm trying to make David happy beyond sure. the grave. So, so th- that was very similar. Yeah, yeah. So, so I had that kind of bittersweet uh, component to it. Yeah, and if, I mean, I like the way you frame that, um, the idea of sort of trying to complete these works of, you know, these masters of, of uh, recorded music and perform music. When I think about that, I, I, I guess I feel it would be just maybe a crippling pressure or anxiety about, um, and I won't, I won't ask you to admit if you had those feelings, but how were you... Um, sort of what guided you through that when you, you didn't necessarily have, I mean, you were working with Mark 
you had um, other connections to Bowie, but um, mm-hmm. those moments, if you had insecurity or, or doubt, mm-hmm. um, how did you sort of handle that? That's a very interesting question. <laughs> Sorry um, to put you on the spot. No, that's okay. I mean, it, it wasn't really, I mean, the, ha- the, the first part of that, I'll say, the Harry part of that, Harry Nielsen record, part of that question that actually was a lot easier Mm. because I didn't have that same kind of emotional uh, connection no I I did yeah I guess you can say that I mean I didn't and it didn't mean that you weren't connected to it emotionally you always are personal personal connection yeah exactly I didn't have the personal connection where Mark really did and I Mm. could feel it and I could recognize it and it was similar to me making the Bowie record Mm -hmm. where you really <laughs> wished that that they were there, and they're not. So, it is kind of this strange feeling. Now, in terms, so so anxiety wasn't really um, part of that. I mean, you have because the Harry Niel- Nielsen record was um, part um, sort of restoration, and there is there is that sort of challenge to it. That adds a particular. Um, complexity to making the record that's very different than Mm -hmm. than me uh, making the Bowie record so but the Bowie record was I don't know if anxiety is the right word because it it, it, but but um I don't think it is I think it's more of a there's a certain there was a certain kind of weight felt on the shoulders okay is kind of and it was a daily of course thing and, and you're just living with it as you're making this record um and even, I, I, I can't speak for the other musicians on it, but I think they sort of have their degree of that, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know I, the, the bulk of it was on me because I was kind of, you know, in it every day. But um, as people would come in and out, uh, Reeves in particular, because we spent a lot of time uh, redoing parts and doing overdubs and stuff, and... and uh, we had a lot of conversations about it, so so I know that it was heavy for 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 a lot of people. And it, you kind of imagine the closer that you were to David, and the more you knew him, it kind of just the heavier it became. You yeah. know what I mean? So so I wouldn't say it was anxiety, but it was certainly a weight on the shoulders to just think, you know, I really want to do this the right way. You want to do it thinking that David's sitting on the couch, nodding his head. You want to put the you do the best you can to put those imaginary restraints on things that you think he wouldn't like. Mm-hmm. It's 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 an it's a completely impossible task, but creatively you have to get there and you imagine it, and that's what I did. And and so and it wasn't just using like for example I said time will crawl in two thousand and eight. That was him really producing that. Um, of course, that was a blueprint, but it was more than that because it was. It became my entire experience with him. So it was all of his influences, everything we had talked about, and it just kind of culminated into okay, this is what he likes. This is the things that he and, and of course it's not. It's never going to be him. Mm-hmm. But you, you do, uh, you do what you think. Uh, was is right for that the album i mean the good part about that is that um the the songs that i had to to work on were basically like very fancy demos so you take these very fancy demos and you basically strip it all back and you have a clean vocal to work with Mm -hmm. and now you can build a new album around it so the good part is that it's david and he wrote these songs and i'm not messing with the songs or you know there's no lyrics or change all his vocals are there and these are songs that he loved. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, Mario, this has been great. Uh, we really appreciate you being so generous with your time yeah. and your experience. You're uh, where can people find out more about what you're up to? Uh, probably, I mean, I'm on Instagram. That's a good way to see. I mean, but that's mostly just pictures and stuff. So um, the best way is to go to my manager's website, jodiambrosio.com. Or I think his actually his web address is jdmanagement.com. Okay. But we'll make sure we we'll post that it in the description. And I have a, a bio in there, and, and that's probably the best way. Now, my website is mariomcnulty.com, but that just leads to an email. So, okay. um, so Instagram and then my manager's site, yeah. Okay. Well, this has been Mario McNulty at Incognito NYC. Please check him out on Instagram and on the web. 
and it's Ryan from Red Panda Recording. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. Until we see you next time, take care.